good evening everyone and uh, welcome to another one of the inos international webinars and uh, uh, again as before we have lined up some of the best in the business always a pleasure to listen to dr andrew lee and dr prem subramaniam and our own dr mahesh who is an outstanding speaker and uh, his knowledge in neurophysiological disorders is phenomenal so Uh, it's going to be a wonderful pleasurable evening where we are going to uh, learn enjoy interact and uh, i hope all of us will go back wiser uh, i'll i'll just uh, uh, take a minute to talk about the inos inos is the indian neurophysiology society it's now been 2 years since we've been established we've had some uh, two amazing conferences with a lot of international participation and we were to have another one this year but unfortunately Uh, uh we couldn't have the annual conference we are having a series of webinars and hopefully our outreach is is much more because of uh, uh the online programs that we are hosting and this is probably one of those very very extremely rare benefits of the corona that we are uh, we are having so uh, again uh, uh welcome all of you uh, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to have these wonderfully interactive sessions Uh, i have with me uh, rashmin who is the vice president of inos i have dr ambika dr digvijay uh, dr satya and dr ankur uh, who are also uh, with me on the inos executive and others will hopefully join and we hope that uh, this is being heard all over the world and uh, thank you and god for making this possible for us so i'll just ask uh, rashmin for a couple of words before we start with andrew for his talk Thank you, Rohit, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Andrew Lee, Dr. Payam, and Dr. Mahesh for consenting to be part of this webinar. And without further ado, let me uh, invite a good friend, Dr. Andrew Lee, who is joining us from Houston, and he'll start this talk. Any, all yours. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking about optic neuritis versus NAION, and I think Prem is going to talk about management. So it's very important that we. cooperate and collaborate even during these troubled times so i'm very thankful to be here with my friends and colleagues from the indian neurophysiology society so what i want to cover for you is typical optic neuritis versus typical naion and my father's rule of ducks if it flies like a duck and looks like a duck and quacks like a duck well probably it's a duck i want to compare and contrast for you and what i want to show you is how also to tell the difference between a mone and a mane and that's what aion and optic neuritis is at the end you'll tell Mone from Mane. Atypical optic neuritis could still be NAION, and atypical NAION could still be optic neuritis. And if it's atypical, you probably should order an MRI scan, and that's the main teaching point of the talk. How do you really differentiate the atypicals? Optic neuritis will enhance, and I'm sure Prem's going to cover that in more detail. So my dad would say, if it quacks like a duck and looks like a duck and flies like a duck, then it's probably a duck. And that's the same with Mone versus Mane. So if you look at Mone and Mane, they both lived at the same time. They lived in Paris. They knew each other. They sometimes exhibited their art in the same shows. They're both impressionistic. And Mone is O, outdoors, blurry, light, and landscape. And Mane, with an A, is studio, realistic, romantic, and people. So at the end of this talk, you'll not only know O-N, optic neuritis, from A-I-O-N, non-organic anterior ischemic arthropathy, you'll know Mone with a O from Mane with A. So just with that information, you already know who's Mone and who's blurry Mane. The outdoor blurry weird color light person, that's Mone. So just look at the water of Mone versus Mane. So you'll be able to tell now what is a typical Mone And what is a typical Mane? Mane, more precise. Mane, more people. Mone, water, blurry, color. So, Mane versus Mone. The Mane, A-I-O-N, older patient, vasculopath, uncommon to have pain with eye movement, altitudinal field defect, because the blood supply of the optic nerve is top and bottom, risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and you have to have a swollen nerve. The nerve has to be swollen. That's the A in AION. We have to have anterior. If you don't have the A, that is N-A-I-O ain't. That ain't no AION. You have to have a swollen optic nerve. And we're going to be looking for a small cup to disc ratio as well. 
In contrast, Monet, the optic neuritis, is a younger patient. They're going to have pain with eye movement. It's going to be a central depression or a central field defect, although it can be altitudinal. And we're going to be looking for demyelinating multiple sclerosis on the MRI scan. The disc is usually normal in the United States, but in India, it might be swollen. And so now you see why I was asked to give this talk, because this slide right here is a talk for white people USA optic neuritis. And Rohi wrote a very nice paper, which was described previously on how you have more disc edema. So the MRI scan of the head is really the way that I differentiate atypical optic neuritis from atypical NAION. Typical NAION does not need an MRI scan. However, if you do do an MRI scan and you see enhancement, it's pretty much not NAION. That is not quacking right. If we see periventricular white matter lesions, you're going to be thinking about demyelinating MS. If we see only small vessel ischemia, that's going to be NAION. And of course, the, the course for AION is stable or minimal improvement. Some patients get a few lines back. Optic neuritis usually recovers regardless of whether we give intravenous steroids or no steroids or high dose oral steroids. They, they all get better. Intravenous steroids makes people get better faster. Steroids have no proven benefit in the non-arteritic form of AION, but in giant cell arteritis, the arteritic form, of course, you're going to be doing steroids. And the systemic evaluation in NAION is going to be aimed at blood pressure, blood sugar, blood cholesterol, weight loss, diet, exercise, and perhaps an aspirin a day, although that's controversial. I use the aspirin for preventing MI and heart attack and stroke. In contrast, optic neuritis, the thing you're looking for is MS, the MS mimics sarcoidosis, lupus, the usual suspects, and the MS-like illnesses, which are antibody-mediated, NMO and MOG, and I'm sure Prem's going to cover that. So what does this look like? A 20-year-old white female with acute unilateral loss of vision, a mild scotoma, normal fundus, pain with eye movement, RAPD, that is typical retrobulbar optic neuritis in the United States, i.e. a duck. That's a duck. It's not going to be a duck, however, if it's bilateral and simultaneous or sequential, or if the patient has no risk factor or they have severe pain, or if it's not flying right, if we see disc edema or a macular star figure or cotton wool patch or other white stuff in the fundus, neither optic neuritis nor NAION is associated with cotton wool patches. If we see cotton wool patches, that's really going to be vasculitis, and the most common vasculitis we're going to be worried about in the elderly is giant cell. In a young patient with optic neuritis, the most common vasculitis that we're thinking about is actually lupus, an antiphospholipid antibody. But if you see white stuff, that's pretty much not optic neuritis and not NAION. Those are both atypical. <clears throat> and for NAION, we're really going to be looking at that cup-to-disc ratio, because if we see a small cup-to-disc ratio, that's the typical structural disc at risk for NAION. If a big cup-to-disc ratio, that is... Uh, giant cell or some other problem. And of course, coroidal folds does not occur in either NAION nor on optic neuritis. And one of the big red flags is when we have light perception or no light perception vision. That is a very atypical finding for both the non-arteritic form of AION and for optic neuritis, even the demyelinating forms. And so when we see NLP, no light perception, or LP, light perception vision, we really should be thinking about the MS mimics in that setting. That's lupus and sarcoid, and also the MS-like illnesses like NMO and MLG. In addition, if it doesn't get better or it's progressive or it keeps coming back, those are really big red flags that it's atypical, regardless of whether it's atypical optic neuritis or atypical NAION. And so all of these are not a duck. We got uh, cotton wool patches. We got a macular star figure. We got white stuff on the disc or white stuff in the disc or choroidal folds. All of these are very atypical. Likewise, cupping of this degree, the reason cupping is not very common in optic neuritis is because most patients with optic neuritis are young people and glaucoma is uncommon in that age range. And cupping is not common in NAION because it's a small cup to disc ratio, not a big cup to disc ratio that is normally associated with NAION. So all of these are neither optic neuritis nor NAION. So you should know what a typical duct looks like for NAION. It's typically acute unilateral loss of vision. In this example, a 60-year-old white female with multiple vasculopathic risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, acute unilateral loss of vision, RAPD, 
And it's similar to optic neuritis. They can have pain with eye movement, but the distinguishing feature is we have to have the A in AION. That A is anterior, and anterior to the lamina cribosa means we have to have disc edema. So we have to see the disc edema. And of course, you're going to be looking in the fellow eye for the small cup to disc ratio. So this is a typical duct. And so the same thing for optic neuritis applies to NAION. It's not a duct, not optic neuritis, typical optic neuritis, and it's not typical NAION if it's bilateral, simultaneous, or rapidly sequential. If the patient's too young and has no risk factor, if they have severe disc edema, a macular star figure or hemorrhages, cotton wool patches or white stuff in the nerve or in the retina, or anywhere really white stuff just doesn't happen in NAION or in optic neuritis on the typical duct. And those choroidal folds, that usually means you got a mass in the orbit pressing on the eye, and that's why the disc is swollen, or though that's actually the cause of the retrobulbar optic neuropathy, mimicking optic neuritis. And of course, just like for optic neuritis, severe vision loss, light perception or no light perception vision, progressive, non-recovering or recurrent are all big red flags that it's not a duct. And so if you look at the cumulative rates of recovery in optic neuritis from the optic neuritis treatment trial, you see that all three groups, methylprednisolone, placebo, and prednisone, everybody gets better. Intravenous steroids just gets their field better faster. And the same for visual acuity. Everybody gets better, but they get better faster if you have IV steroids. And so when we have rapid improvement of visual acuity with steroids, we really should be thinking about optic neuritis. And of course, you know that in the optic neuritis treatment trial, you were more likely to get a recurrence of your optic neuritis if you were in the prednisone group, the oral prednisone group. And so usually we're going to use intravenous prednisone here, and I'm sure Prem's going to cover that. The only point I want to make is at 15 years, a lot of these patients have MS. But of course, you know from Rohit study and many others that Indian optic neuritis looks a little bit different than Indian um, than American optic neuritis and Western optic neuritis. But the main point is, even if the MR is normal, it could still be demyelinating disease. And if you look at visual change between baseline and follow-up in the ischemic optic neuropathy decompression trial, this is zero, which means it didn't get better or worse. Most of the people with AION, baseline to six months and baseline to 12 months, really kind of stayed the same, or if they got a little bit better or a little bit worse. So the vast majority of people with ischemic optic neuropathy either don't change or change a little bit. But if you've got big changes either direction, getting worse or getting better, uh, you really should be thinking maybe this person had optic neuritis or has an optic neuropathy from another cause, and that means imaging. So I don't image NIN, but I image atypical NIN, and if it's not quacking right, you should image it. So here's what we're looking for on the MRI scan. You can see the fat is very bright on T1. We want to suppress that fat. So this is a fat suppressed axial T1 of the orbit. And you can see the little bit of enhancement right here in this optic nerve on the left. And that is a typical duct. So we need to have that fat suppression. And so with fat suppression, we're going to be looking for gadolinium enhancement. And if you look at this study from Cooper Smith et al. from Brain, most of the patients 95% of the patients have some degree of enhancement, but most of the enhancement is a relatively small amount, so 10 millimeters, one, one centimeter of enhancement. Once you start getting to big enhancement, longitudinally extensive enhancement, you really should be thinking about NMO or MOG if it's in the sheath, and I'm sure Prem will cover that. But the point I wanted to make is no enhancement. No enhancement is weird for optic neuritis. So if you look at the data from the Cooper Smith trial, if you have no enhancement, that was only 5.6% of the patients. So you should be very worried about the diagnosis of optic neuritis if we don't see any enhancement. So that occurs in 5.6% of the patients, but we really have to see that enhancement on the MR to be confident that this patient has optic neuritis. And so when they don't have enhancement, I get worried that it's another optic neuropathy, including NAION. And so now you should be able to tell very easily now that this is man A, realistic, indoors, sharp lines, photorealistic colors versus Monet, blurry, and getting blurrier and blurrier because of his cataract. It's all about the light. It's outdoors in Monet. And you should know that we're going to use the flare to look for the CSF lesions in MRI. 
And one of the things that's a problem is differentiating the vascular lesions from small vessel ischemia from the MS lesions. So if we see corpus callosum and U-fiber involvement, that's very common in MS and very uncommon in vascular. And so even though both are producing white matter lesions, the key and differentiating features are early involvement, periventricular, infratentorial spine, and supratentorial corpus callosum and U-fiber. All of these are very uncommon in the small vessel ischemic findings of MRI scans. Of course, the the main teaching point is no enhancement on NAION of the optic nerve or of the vascular lesions, but in MS, especially the active lesions, some of those lesions might be enhancing after gadolinium, including the optic nerve. And then we're going to be looking for those corpus callosal lesions, often to refer to as Dawson's fingers coming out with a symmetric and diffuse rather than asymmetric distribution of the white matter lesions. So when I'm looking at these MRI scans in the patient who has optic neuropathy, sometimes the reports come back, there is multifocal white matter lesions. It could be ischemia, it could be demyelination. And so we have to go back and look at those scans because we're looking for typical lesions. Typical lesions would be like in the temporal lobe, red, corpus callosum here in the blue, juxtacortical, U fiber in the green, and periventricular, ovoid, and perpendicular to the ventricle. So it's not enough just to say the MRI scan showed white matter lesions. We need to know where those white matter lesions were, and you should try and characterize those white matter lesions as temporal, corpus callosal, juxtacortical, U-fiber, periventricular, and enhancing. If you using those words, then those white matter lesions support optic neuritis over multiple from multiple sclerosis or demyelinating disease over NAION white matter lesions. And so the key and differentiating features are, again, the juxtacortical U-fiber, and you can see why it's called a U-fiber in green here, versus the subcortical white matter lesions in ischemia. So you can see why it's going to be confusing a little bit because subcortical white matter ischemic disease is going to be seen on the MRI scan of NAION. And so if you do do an MRI scan of NAION, you have to be able to differentiate the NAION white matter lesions from the periventricular ovoid juxtacortical U-fiber corpus callosal enhancing and Dawson finger lesions of MS. So in summary, hopefully what I've shared with you is how I differentiate typical optic neuritis from typical NAION in the clinic, and I follow Dad's rule of ducks. You should now know what a typical case looks like for each of those. A typical optic neuritis, acute, unilateral, retrobulbar optic neuropathy in a young person versus a typical NAION, acute, unilateral, optic neuropathy with a swollen disc, and you have to have that A for AION, small cup to disc ratio in the fellow eye, no pain with eye movement, and to compare and contrast so that you can tell who is Monet and who is Manet. Anybody who has an atypical optic neuritis or an atypical NAION, you should probably think about scanning that person. And if we're doing an MRI scan, you should now be able to differentiate the white matter lesions of ischemia from the white matter lesions of demyelination based on the U-fibers, juxtacortical, Dawson fingers, corpus callosum, temporal lobe localization, periventricular and ovoid, and most importantly, enhancement. Enhancement either of the optic nerve or of the brain lesions, which are very atypical in ischemia. And so, at the end of this talk, which one's MANA? AION, and which one's Monet, I don't think there's any doubt that the blurry, outdoor, fuzzy, light one is Monet optic neuritis, and the indoor, sharp, clear, detailed is Manet. And I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, uh, Andy. Uh, lovely talk, and uh, you elucidated the differences between the NAION and optic neuritis nicely. Any questions from the panel? So, um, while we'll wait for some questions to come up, uh, I think Vijay and Ankur would be searching. So, one of the things uh, is what uh, concerns us is we often see patients who present with unilateral sudden loss of vision in an older patient. And in NAIM, we've also noticed that we tend to have much younger patients than what's seen in the West. So, 
Uh, in fact, in, in the trial that we had done, uh, which we were part of the global trial uh, on evaluating the uh, NEION interventional study, many of our patients could not be included. In fact, I believe 20% could not be included because they were younger. So we have a fair amount of patients who are between 40 to 45 who present with sudden onset loss of vision with a bit of disc edema. Now, on the onset, what would be you know, my key thing which I would want to know whether it's ischemia or, you know, a late onset presentation of an optic neuritis. So one is, of course, an MRI, but if an MRI is in equivocal or does not have significant findings, what else and how would how should I, uh, you know, move ahead? Should I think of giving steroids as a, you know, chance or uh, should I observe and follow up? <clears throat> yeah, so one of the interesting things is about these conferences and what the power of these international conferences is, I get to learn something about what Indian NIN looks like and what Indian optic neuritis looks like. And Prem heard me say this before. Houston, Texas, including Prem's family, it has 150,000 Indians here in Houston, Texas. So when I see an Indian person in the United States who I think has NAION, but they're 45 and they have no risk factor, yeah. I'm kind of getting nervous that that person actually has optic neuritis. So I'm going to do an MRI scan on that person. And the same for what you just outlined, an NAION person in a younger patient, and even though we say NAION is an older people thing, it ha definitely happens in any age range. So the things that would make me say, scan this person with NAION, pain with eye movement, no vasculopathic risk factor, Indian person, young patient, um, progression, or if they have rapid response to the steroid. So I don't normally give steroid anymore to NAION, but I do give it to these people where I'm not sure, and that's called hedging your bet. So I, I kind of hedge my bet on these NION, might be optic neuritis people. But to answer your question, I really am looking at that MRI. Because optic neuritis, 96% of the time, the nerve will enhance on a good, high-quality MR head orbit getting yeah, fat sat. So I scrutinize that. And if I see even one drop of enhancement, I'm going to change my diagnosis from NION to optic neuritis. I wish there was a biomarker for <coughs> NION. Go to the lab and get your NION test, but there isn't. I wish there was a biomarker for MS. There isn't. And so we're stuck with what you just said, because I said so. Because Rohit said it might be NION. Because Andy Lee said it might be optic neuritis. That's all you got. So the short answer to your question, if you think it's optic neuritis, go for it. If you think it's NION, go for it. If you're uncertain, do an MRI. If you're still uncertain, I'd give that person IV steroids. Because even if it's NAON in a young person, what, what would that do? Nothing. So that's what I do. I don't know. Prem might have something different to say. Uh, that, that, that's, what I tell, that's what I tell patients in my clinic, which is uh, look exactly at the things you're looking at, Andy. Are they young? Are they not white? Do they have pain? Is there anything else funny going on? I'll talk a little bit about um, hemorrhages around the optic disc. You know, any ION can have hemorrhage on the disc, but like MOG optic neuritis can often have a lot of hemorrhage around the optic disc. So, you know, again, the not duck things are, are, are what I'm looking for. And I agree with you totally. We can't, you know, we don't have an NAION treatment. If we think it might be optic neuritis, we give them steroids, they get better. Not only is the patient happy, we've got a diagnosis and we've done the right thing. So, um, you know, the typical 65 year old smoker hypertensive who comes in, no, I'm not going to be scanning that person, but the category we're talking about, absolutely, you're going to be more likely to do that and look. I have a question for both Dr. Lee, Dr. Prem. Um, <clears throat> the question is that in your practices, what percentage of the optic neuritis kind of are typical or the ones that you can put in the, you know, typical optic neuritis bucket straight away or the classic NAI one straight away? And what percentage is actually in, lying in the gray area, which you need to kind of apply your mind? What's your typical, you know, uh, clinical profiles like? So for my practice in the United States, most of the time I can tell, like it's a duck. I would say 80%, 90%, I just know it's NAI one I just know it's optic neuritis. 10%, I'm unsure, and don't let anybody fool you into thinking it's not 10%, like I can tell every time. I cannot. And in the 90%, I just told you I was sure, about 1% of the people, I was sure, and I was wrong. So, you know, 
uh, I'm wearing my scrubs because surgeons, you know, even though I'm not a surgeon, they always have a saying, which is sometimes wrong, never in doubt. So there, there, there's never any doubt when you make the diagnosis, but then it's wrong. However, my caveat to you and this Indian audience is your giant cell is younger. Your NAION is younger. Your optic neuritis is older. Your optic neuritis, and Rohit showed this, is disc edema. And Ambika said, your optic neuritis and your optic perineuritis is sometimes tuberculosis. So I, I, I has, I'm a little bit nervous about some of these international things because sometimes I say things and I know the Indian people go offline and say, that's, that's not what we see, but they don't want to tell me. <laughs> they just let me think that. They are like, God, Dr. Lee is way off base on that. that. That's TB, right? Yeah, that was TB. I don't know why he said that. I don't know, Prem. Yeah, I mean, right. In India, if you guess TB, you're going to be right half the time, right? But uh, for us, uh, my practice, probably because I have a little different mix or maybe just I'm not as good as you, Andy. Maybe 85% of the time when it comes in, I know what it is. And uh, the other 15% of the time, I'm a little unsure and more likely to get some other testing there. We, we have a little bit. We, Andy sits in a city where he has a huge population sitting right there. I sit in the part of the country where people come from a thousand miles away because there's no neuro-ophthalmologist near them. They work around cows and sheep and also do all sorts of weird things and smoke marijuana and do other stuff. So it's, it's a different mix of patients. And so I think that's what Andy's speaking to as well, that in each place where you practice, you have to have your own suspicions. So I know that Rokhita also have published that maybe there's a little difference between North India and South India in terms of some of the population dynamics there and, and what kind of diseases patients are likely to have. So that's, I think, the key that both Andy and I are saying is that Yes, know what typical optic neuritis looks like. Know what typical NAION looks like. You have to know that. And those are the things that come in the door most of the time. But don't also hesitate <clears throat> to scratch your head and say, hmm, that doesn't look right. And when it doesn't, um, you know, don't be confident <laughs> that you know what it is. Get some more information. Andy, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, you have a clinical... Clinically, you are uh, absolutely sure that this patient has non-arthritic uh, anti-ischemic optic neuropathy, but you can't find a, a risk factors, a common risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. What do you do next? What is your protocol if you don't have risk factors? So I, I get very nervous about those no risk factor people. I consider that to be not quacking right. Um, I do an ultrasound of those people looking for drusen. It makes me feel better if I find drusen, because then I can say, oh, look, I found the cause of your NION. Um, but I get nervous about those people. I used to do full hypercoagulable state workups on those people. I don't do that anymore. I do limited, though, like easy things, antiphospholipid antibody. That, that's what I do. Um, I scan them. I scan those NAIONs of the young. So the NAIONs I scan are the progressives, the recurrence, <laughs> The young people, no risk factor. Those four I scan. The other thing I do on those NAIONs where they don't have a risk factor is I do a sleep study on them. Even if they don't have sleep apnea or they claim not to have it, a lot of those people have it. I think mostly I'm doing it to make myself feel better because I have yet to do a sleep study where I didn't find they had sleep apnea. So I guess Houston is sleep apnea central. I bet if I did it on me, I'd have it too. Um, Anyway, that's what I do. I'll just make an extra little sidebar comment about what Prem said. Believe it or not, I ask our Indian people, are they from North India or South India? Because I have seen the thing that, that Rohit and, and Bika have looked at, the North-South gradient. It's here in Houston, too, for two diseases, giant cell and for multiple sclerosis. So we have a North-South gradient in our Indian subpopulation here in Houston, Texas. And I find that to be fascinating. I have not looked at that in any kind of scientific way, but I just ask them, where are you from? And when they say that North India thing, I'm like, oh, I better start thinking a little more about MS and giant cell here. Amika, you had some question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Amika, it's an interesting point. Yes, sorry. Okay. Uh, Andy, uh, if you have a young maid walking in with an acute drop in vision with a central scotoma, and probably a disc which is not looking that much edematous, how frequently you will be able to differentiate that from an acute Leber's 
hereditary optic neuropathy versus an acute optic neuritis? So acute labor hereditary optic neuritis and uh, optic neuritis look the same. So you should be very careful about telling a young male with a central scotoma who has no pain with eye movement, especially if the MRI scan is normal, that it's going to get better. So that particular person, I don't tell them they're going to get better. I say, look, it's probably going to get better. It's probably optic neuritis, but we got to worry about this labor thing. It's a genetic thing. And if you don't get better or it goes in your other eye, uh, please call me because it might be labor. And that way, they're already prepped for it, and they can go Google it. The other thing that makes me nervous is when I don't see the RAPD. So when the resident comes out of the room and says, and they're 2,200 and there was no RAPD, usually I say, well, you don't know how to test an RAPD. Look. And then I'm like, wait a minute, there's no RAPD. That person also is a dangerous for labor hereditary optic neuropathy. So I definitely have a different spiel, a different talk for young male central scotoma, especially if it's painless. And if the MR is normal, I already prepped that person that could be labor. If the MRI picks up a signal, what is your take at that time? <laughs> do you treat him with the IV steroids? Yes, I do. I give every one of these IV steroids. In the old days, I would have said you can choose not to treat if you want. But because you can't tell who actually has NMO or MOG anymore, so I treat those. So if the MRI scan shows white matter lesions, I do follow the optimized treatment trial in terms of you could have steroids or not, you get better faster with IV, but if it shows no white matter lesions, amazingly, a normal MRI is an indication for me to give intravenous steroids because I don't know if that's MOG or NMO. So that's the person that really scares the bejesus out of me because I don't know who that is. I do not do the NMO and MOG if the MR shows white matter lesions consistent with MS. But the normal MRI person I do, and the normal MRI scan I do give intravenous steroids to. Uh, Andy, I have a Sorry. Yeah, please. Uh, I have a question for you, Andy. Expanding on Dr. Ambika's question, uh, do you think color vision has got some significance in differentiating LHON versus optimuritis? I use... I do the color vision on every single person, uh, mostly so my text will have something to do, but uh, I think it's helpful. So in NAION, the color vision is usually pretty good. In optic neuritis, it can be the only thing down. Like they're 20-20, but they got five on the four, out of 14 color plates. So when I see that disconnect between the acuity and the color, that dyschromatopsia to me suggests it's demyelinating optic neuritis over NAION. The problem is, NAION also causes decreased color, so it's not that helpful, but it's another piece of information that I use to justify whatever the heck I want to do. So I, I'm like what Prem said, you know, you do more testing, but really you're doing more testing to justify what you already think it is. In LHON, LHON, the color vision. The color vision in LHON, they have this central scotoma <laughs> thing. So when my texts check the color, they're always 0 out of 14. But really, they have this central scotoma in the middle. They can kind of tell what the number is. So I have a very bad experience with my text checking that color vision because they always write 0. But really, it's because there's this black, black spot in the center of the vision. They, they can actually see some color. I don't know what kind of experience with dyschromatopsia is. Yeah, well, actually, it's a... When we're using the pseudoisochromatic plates, whether it's HRR or Ishihara, you're not actually you're not truly testing color vision. You're testing a surrogate for contrast sensitivity, and we know that optic neuritis really drops your contrast sensitivity. And so that's why, like Andy said, you get these patients who are 2066, but they can't see any of the color plates because their contrast sensitivity is off. But then you have patients who um, have a big scotoma, and that's why they can't see it. But I think one thing to keep in mind is maybe NAION doesn't damage your contrast sensitivity as much as optic neuritis or LHON, and that's why they do badly on the color plates. But I, I agree. Color plates are, I'm never going to make a decision solely on that basis. I expect it to be down in optic neuritis. I expect it to be down in LHON. But if it's not, that doesn't mean I'm going to throw the diagnosis out the window. One question, Andy, I wanted to ask was that uh, uh, how would the uh, MRI of the orbits, uh, MRI contrast of the orbits look uh, in any ION or even in arthritic optic neuropathy? 
And is there any role of uh, diffusion weighted imaging or the ADC of the optic nerve? Because we saw some case reports and papers coming up, but as of now, we probably have not uh, you know, reached success in that technology. I think DWI can show ischemic optic neuropathy. The, the ones that are most prominent in our practice is when it's post-surgical NAIN, like they wake up blind. Those people often have DWI abnormalities. But run-of-the-mill garden variety, the typical duck NAIN, I hardly ever see anything. I mean, you can hallucinate some T2 change sometimes, but I really kind of don't believe those papers where they show enhancement and it's NAION. I actually think those papers where the nerve was enhancing didn't have NAION. Because how do, how do you know that was NAION? So I don't believe any of those papers with enhancing nerves or NAION. I don't, I don't know what Prem thinks about that. Yeah, I, I, I'm always very skeptical of that. It's, it's hard to understand. Yeah, the reason is, I think, consider NAION to be an intraocular disc head problem, a posterior ciliary artery problem of the disc head. I don't consider NAION to be retrobulbar. So when they, when they say AION, and the, I think they mean PION shows DWI, that oh. I see. So that, but to, that to me is not a duck. I mean, I guess it's non-arteritic, and it is ischemic, but that's not what I mean by NAION. Yeah, that's it's like, not anterior, right? I mean, that's the point that Andy made, is that it's, if it's not anterior, then by definition, it's not typical NAION. And that's when you start looking for other stuff. I will say, though, the arteritic form sometimes enhances. So that, that is the dangerous one also. So, and that's a big problem here in the United States. I would uh, used to teach, look, the old person, acute bilateral loss of vision, that's dying cell until proven otherwise. But now we do a MRIs by accident on some of these people, and the nerve is enhancing. So now you have to think about NMO and MOG in this old person. So now I say acute bilateral vision loss in old person with optic nerve enhancement. GCA, also GCA, but it could be NMO or MOG. So the list got bigger, even in the old people. So I guess sometimes you end up disagreeing with yourself. Sometimes people send me stuff that I wrote. I'm like, who said that? Yeah, That's ridiculous. <laughs> and I was like, you said that. Well, I disagree with whoever wrote that as an idiot. But it was so, me. <laughs> it was great. Things are getting tougher for us with time. As we know more, we realize we know less. So, yeah, Ambika, I think we'll have a last word or any okay. question, and then we'll move yeah. on to the next I just part. have a question. Andy, coming back to Libus, will Libus have an optic nerve signal on MRI? Yeah, so that's another one of those. Sometimes it does enhance. So, but it's usually like real short segment and like scrutinize it and publish it, that kind of enhancement. That's the kind of enhancement you see in labor, like write it up and, you know, you have to squint real hard and hallucinate the, um, I don't like enhancement for labor either for the, for the same reasons, but I do, um, I do work that up. Okay. Thank you. So oh, great, great, wonderful, Andrew. That was a wonderful talk and the discussion was super. So we now go on to the second part of uh, this session. We're going to have Prem talk on how do I investigate and manage optic neuritis. So Prem, close yours. Okay, thank you. So like Andy, I really enjoy meeting with all my colleagues here and learning from you as I talk as well. And so for the next little bit, we're going to talk about how I investigate managed optic neuritis. Um, some of this is tailored to the audience here in terms of what you do in India versus and other parts of Asia versus North America. But what doesn't change is, as we've already been discussing, you first have to decide the patient has optic neuritis. Andy helps you with that. Then you're going to decide, is it typical retrobulbar optic neuritis. I'll go into a little more what that means. Everything else is atypical. You're going to tailor investigation based on causes, right? So this is about how I investigate and then manage and then recommend short and long-term treatments as indicated because the thinking about short versus long-term management differs a lot depending on what you think is causing the optic neuritis. So here we have a 28-year-old woman She's got a new right-sided headache, and three days later, she has right eye vision loss. She has pain with eye movement, and she's otherwise well. So I may have some turkeys in here, but I don't have, and this is a duck. And this duck 
has decreased vision, has a two plus RAPD, pain with eye movement, although the eye movements are full, and a normal anterior and posterior segment examination. So this is a patient who has typical retrobulbar because we're not seeing anything in the fundus, optic neuritis. So what are we going to do? Andy already mentioned to you, there's a reflex action here. When you think a patient has a typical retrobulbar optic neuritis, you're going to get an MRI scan. And now my residents will always say, get an MRI scan of the orbit. And sure, an MRI scan of the orbit is important or can be helpful if you're unsure of what the patient has, because here on the right, you can see that there is tremendous enhancement of the right optic nerve compared to the normal non-enhancing nerve. So, okay, you can pat yourself on the back and say this patient has typical retrobulbar optic neuritis. But the real reason that we get MRIs and the real reason that we investigate further was already alluded to in terms of results from the optic neuritis treatment trial and the longitudinal optic neuritis study, which went out to 15 years on following these patients. And so we've talked about ONTT, but I think it's important to remember who was in the trial and who wasn't in the trial, because it was 454 patients, a pretty amazing number. They had optic neuritis unilaterally, so no one with bilateral optic neuritis, and they had to be between 18 and 45. So ONTT didn't capture people who were older than 45. Why is that? Because in general, they're at lower risk for optic neuritis, and they're not going to have typical optic neuritis. Uh, they had to have no systemic disease associated with optic neuritis and no prior steroid treatment. And the ONTT addressed the questions of, do corticosteroids improve visual recovery? Is the rate of recurrence changed? And how is the risk of developing MS affected? And so the investigation of patients with typical retrobulbar optic neuritis still centers around that risk of multiple sclerosis. So a different patient here, again, a fat-saturated T1 gadolinium-enhanced image showing enhancement of the right optic nerve going from the back of the globe and kind of midway in the orbit. So a short segment of enhancement within the right optic nerve in a patient with vision loss. But what we're really looking for are the kinds of things that Andy talked about. Now, it can be confusing. This is an MRI from a 75-year-old woman who presented with new vision loss. And you can imagine it was first thought she's 75. She can't have optic neuritis, but she had a normal fundus. She had an RAPD and she had enhancement of her optic nerve. And in fact, she had these classic periventricular white matter lesions. She had U-fiber lesions here. She had other enhancing lesions. And it turns out that she actually had multiple sclerosis that wasn't diagnosed until she was 75 years old. Now, this is not what you're typically going to see, right? The ventricles would be smaller and this would be a younger patient. But when you see enhancement of the optic nerve, you see these black holes, you see these white matter lesions that are typical, that's what's going to drive your thinking as far as risk of multiple sclerosis. Now, in the optic neuritis treatment trial, these patients, 50% of them by 15 years developed MS. And it was stratified by risk of no baseline lesions and then evaluated of those who had more than one baseline lesion. And you can see there's a huge difference here when we look at this, right? 25% of patients with retrobulbar optic neuritis who have no lesions seemed to go on to develop MS at 15 years, while those with more than one lesion, 72% had MS by 15 years. So does that mean that your patient with an abnormal MRI is almost guaranteed to develop multiple sclerosis? Well, a couple of things I want you to take away from this, which I think are a little different from what we do in 2020. The first one is that although 25% of patients developed MS after 15 years, almost nobody developed MS after five years. That's not true for the patients who had one, two, or more than three MRI lesions. But these are MRI lesions on old style MRI. MRI that didn't have gadolinium contrast, MRI that didn't have flare sequences. So these had to be big, obvious lesions or lesions that would show up on a T2 or even the black holes on a T1. So when we see an abnormal MRI scan now in our patients who have 
retrobulbar optic itis. Sure, we're suspicious that they might go on to develop multiple sclerosis, but we should keep in mind that their risk of developing MS down the road is not as high as we think it might have been in the ONTT. And I'll come back to that in terms of treatment of these patients. So we talk a lot about what atypical optic neuritis is. In North America, atypical optic neuritis often occurs in someone who's a little older, 37, someone who's black, not white. This patient had a foreign body sensation. Not, she didn't describe as pain, but then she developed blurred vision. She hadn't traveled outside the US. She was from the Caribbean. She was black, as I mentioned. She had mildly decreased visual acuity, but abnormal color vision, normal in the other eye, a trace RAPD, and a quiet anterior segment. Now, sometimes these patients will come in with raging optic disc swelling, and here it's not going to be challenging to see that there might be something atypical, but this was actually what this patient's fundus looked like, and until you looked carefully and noticed that there was this edema spreading out into the nerve fiber layer from the disc and that she had a normal-looking fellow optic nerve, this might have been mistaken for typical retrobulbar optic neuritis. So the fundus exam is important in patients who have optic neuritis because they can have cell swelling that might point you to an atypical feature. And this was her MRI scan. She had certainly enhancement of the optic nerve, but she had a lot of enhancement of her optic nerve sheath and even a little spillover of that enhancement into the perioptic nerve fat. And that is a highly characteristic of an atypical optic neuritis, in particular MOG optic neuritis, as I'll show you. Here we have a different atypical patient, 18-year-old Korean female, previously healthy bilateral eye pain, but decreased vision only in her left eye. She has a moderate RAPD in her left eye, normal acuity in her right eye, and mild left optic disc swelling. But now you get an MRI scan of this patient and she has bilateral findings, right? So even though the arrows are pointing to this very long segment of enhancement of her optic nerve on the left side, even the right side is enhancing as well. So this is obviously it's retrobulbar, but it's highly atypical to get this long segment of enhancement and to have bilaterality at presentation. And this shows just different images, stir images showing thickening of the optic nerve on the left side more than the right side. So what's in your differential diagnosis when you think a patient has an atypical optic neuritis? You know, we mentioned these things on the right, and we tend to jump straight to NMO and MOG, particularly in the Western world. But infectious disorders clearly can do it. Viral disorders like HIV or dengue or other viruses, particularly seen in the tropical areas, uh, tr never forget syphilis and other treponemal diseases. And don't forget that the patient can to develop an optic neuritis, a typical optic neuritis picture if they've been given certain drugs like linazolid. Um, Andy mentioned the steroid dependent or responsive conditions like sarcoidosis or what's been called cryon, chronic relapsing, uh, optic neuropathy, and uh, Paraneoplastic syndromes can't be forgotten, particularly if the patient's a little bit older and maybe they may not have a cancer history, but keep that in your mind as well. But I'll spend the rest of this uh, talk in terms of diagnosis, investigation, talking about the NMO spectrum disorder and MOG because they are the ones that we encounter quite commonly and for which we can do something in the longer term or may need to do something in the longer term. So neuromyelitis optica NMO was of course first described as bilateral optic neuritis with transverse myelitis. The optic neuritis could be sequential or simultaneous, often severe transverse myelitis. These are patients who are often not from Northern Europe, not Caucasian, and their recovery even with treatment often is poor. And the oval there shows you what that longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis looks like in a patient who has NMO. 2015 NMO spectrum disorder criteria came out. Why do we call this NMO spectrum disorder? Well, the aquaporin-4 antibody, an antibody against the astrocyte footplate, was discovered in 2007, and it's been associated very strongly with NMO. So we test patients for that aquaporin-4 antibody. So what test do I do? If I think a patient has atypical optic neuritis, I'm going to get this aquaporin-4 antibody. And if it's positive and they have optic neuritis and the brain doesn't look like an MS kind of brain, then you can be confident that they have NMO. 
if they don't have positivity for this antibody, if their aquaporin-4 antibody is negative, which happens at least 30% of the time, if not more, in patients with NMO spectrum disorder, you have to have what they call two core symptoms, syndromes, optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, or area postrema attack, area postrema, back part of the brain, often patients have nausea, severe nausea, intractable hiccups, itching, paritis all over the body. So you have to remember that you're a doctor and ask them about something other than your vision in order to make this diagnosis. So the NMO IgG, that aquaporin-4 antibody, is a really useful thing to get. It's going to be positive in up to 80% of clinical NMO cases, and it's perhaps 95% or more specific. But the type of test matters. You can get an ELISA or you can get a cell-based assay. And what the graph over here is showing you is that the ELISA often misses positives. And in fact, the ELISA is more likely, paradoxically, to have um, false positives. So it doesn't pick up the real positives, and it might give you a false positive. So guess what test I like? I like the cell-based assay, and I think you should use that whenever possible because the ELISA can mislead you. And then finally, this is a CNS inflammatory condition, right? So you think that testing the CSF is going to be better than testing blood. Nope, not the case. Serum testing is more sensitive for detecting the NMO antibody than testing it in the CSF. I don't bother testing it in the CSF in a discussion. I can see if Andy or any of my colleagues have a different opinion on that. The big reason it's important to show that your patient has the NMO antibody or not, I think, it, you know, they present to you with an NMO spectrum disorder. If they have that antibody being positive, they have a really high likelihood of ending up with a severe transverse myelitis. If they are seronegative for the antibody, sure, that's bad. They still have a condition that you want to take seriously and treat, but their risk of going on to develop the full-blown NMO may be a little bit less. So this MOG that we've all been talking about, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, really only studied in the past 10 to 15 years. And initially, people didn't pay much attention because the assay wasn't so good. But when they developed a good cell-based assay, it was found to be prevalent in pediatric patients who have conditions like acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis and other optic neuropathies. But in 2011, it was the first report of MOG with an patient who was given a diagnosis of animal spectrum disorder. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing because clinically there's this overlap between patients who might be put into a category of animal spectrum disorder and patients who might be put into a category of this MOG associated disease. So if you take a subset of patients who fit the NMO spectrum disorder criteria and you test them for this MOG antibody, you find it. I should say that I've never seen a credible report of a patient who is positive for both the NMO antibody and the MOG antibody. That tells you something. That tells you that these are probably distinct diseases. And it was originally thought maybe this is two types of NMO. You get a monophasic NMO spectrum disorder with MOG positive and a relapsing NMO with MOG negative IgG. No, that, that, that's not the case. MOG is now defined as a separate clinical syndrome. It overall has better outcomes. But actually, a study that came out of India kind of compared MOG disease with those who had a more typical NMO spectrum disorder. And in these 87 patients who were all negative for the aquaporin-4 antibody but didn't fit into a diagnosis of MS either, nearly 30% of them had positive antibody for MOG. So again, if you think your patient has an atypical optic neuritis, they're negative for that NMO antibody, you should go ahead and test for the MOG antibody. And significant number of these patients were men, and there's controversy as to whether men are more likely to be affected than women, but they have a high risk of recurrent optic neuritis, and they have a significant risk of getting a transverse myelitis as well. In those images labeled one over there, the arrows are pointing to an enlargement of the optic nerve, which I said is characteristic of MOG optic neuritis, even more so than NMO. And these big fluffy lesions in the brain on MRI are, again, characteristic of MOG, not of NMO, and not really of multiple sclerosis either. So what do I want you to do when you see a patient who comes in and you think they have optic neuritis? You've already decided they don't have any ION. They have optic neuritis. 
If they have a typical retrobulbar optic neuritis, you first make sure it's typical. Rule out those atypical features, severe vision loss, bilaterality. Are they too young, too old? Are they male? Are they not white? Obtain an MRI scan of the brain in orbit to look for MS risk and consider an MRI of the C-spine if their MRI of the brain is normal because some patients with MS will develop lesions in their cervical spine that help you make the diagnosis as well. If you decide it's atypical optic neuritis, is the disc swollen or not? I mentioned that mob discs often have a lot of hemorrhage and can be confused with NAION, so keep that in mind. MRI changes in the, op um, in the optic nerve are usually more posterior, a greater extent. They may be bilateral, even if the patient is only symptomatic and whatnot. That's a big red flag. Serologic studies, as I mentioned, MOG, MOG, and then for infections, particularly when you're in other parts of the world, and consider a lumbar puncture. So what do we want to do in terms of managing these patients? We've diagnosed either typical or atypical optic neuritis. We've gotten our tests, and now we need to treat the patient. Well, Andy already mentioned that a lot of these test results take some time to come back. And so when the ONTT results first came out, it was suggested as Andy mentioned, that you don't have to treat patients with steroid if they have optic neuritis because most everyone got better. But these unusual or atypical types of optic neuritis, those patients may not get better if you don't treat them. So I don't follow that rule anymore either. I offer every patient who I think has optic neuritis the possibility of getting intravenous corticosteroids not just to increase their speed of recovery, but it may be important to actually bring their vision back. Intravenous methylprednisolone, a gram a day for three to five days. Uh, the benefit of an oral steroid taper afterwards, like was done in the optic neuritis treatment trial, is actually not clear for patients with typical optic neuritis, but those patients who have atypical optic neuritis, like MOG optic neuritis, because they're often very steroid responsive and steroid dependent, a longer corticosteroid taper may be necessary, a long oral taper to prevent them from having a relapse. So in atypical optic neuritis, treatment may facilitate either complete or incomplete recovery and may be a bridging therapy to something else. Corticosteroids don't have a role in the prevention of MS, even though the ONTT said in the first two years it did, the long-term data don't bear that out. There are MS disease modifying agents. There's a lot of controversy as to whether you should start your patient who has optic neuritis and MRI lesions, if you should start them on MS therapy. And that's something you should have a favorite neurologist who's gonna to talk to the patient and discuss all of these matters with them. There may be a role for repeat MRI scans and a nuanced approach to this. But the treatments that we're going to help to direct as ophthalmologists are more in those patients who have atypical optic neuritis like NMO spectrum disorder or MOG. Should you treat those patients with NMO spectrum disorder with corticosteroid? You better believe it. And if they don't get better after the first round, should you treat them again? You should strongly consider it because if you treat even a couple or three times, you can see that the number of patients in this gray category who had no response increase. So in other words, patients who didn't get better at all, they didn't get completely better if you treated them with steroid again, but they might get a little bit better. So those patients who, who don't get better after the first round of steroids, and you think they have NMO spectrum, just consider giving them steroids again. Similarly, if you have access to PLEX, plasma exchange or plasmapheresis, treating those patients with PLEX when they come in with an acute attack is more likely to move them out of the no response category into a partial or even complete response category. And the timing of that PLEX treatment is critical. It can be given at the same time as the IV steroids. It's usually given either daily or every other day over five cycles, and it improves the optic neuritis outcomes. It can improve transverse myelitis outcomes. You can see in the table on the right that I've underlined that the patients who got PLEX actually overall had better visual acuity and better visual field defects than the patients who got corticosteroid. But look at that graph at the bottom. If you start that PLEX, more than five days after the onset of their treatment, the likelihood that they are going to get better, that they're gonna to recover to near their baseline function goes down a lot. So what does that mean? As you see these patients, you think they have atypical optic neuritis, you think they might even have NMO spectrum disorder, 
if you're not comfortable doing these sorts of things like IV steroids and Plex, try to find someone who can work with you who can, because it's critical that this be done quickly. And the use of Plex as either a first or second line agent, there's a little bit of bias in some of these studies because some of the more severe patients get thrown to Plex. But what I want you to take away from this again is that Plex can increase the number of patients who recover. It can increase their likelihood of recovery. And again, showing that the quicker you get them into therapy, the more likely they are to recover. So time is of the essence here. It's not just to help the patient to maybe get better a little bit faster. So what other treatment paradigms are out there? What other things I want you to remember? NMO, once you get them out of this acute phase, MOG, once you get them out of this acute phase, patients may require long-term treatment. So NMO requires immunosuppression if they're antibody positive, especially, but even if they are antibody negative. So we did the acute treatment. There's choices that I'll review for the chronic treatment, but just remember it needs to be done. It's not really an option in my mind. And MS therapy is not effective and may even be harmful. This was demonstrated 10 years ago in a series of patients who were treated with an MS drug in fear on beta, 19 of them. So a third had the therapy stopped because they were getting worse and the majority of them had NMO. So just remember, when you send this patient on to a neurologist to be evaluated and you say they have optic neuritis, make it clear that you think they might have NMO and not multiple sclerosis, that the neurologist is not misled. Long-term immunosuppression is either done with oral agents or with some new injectable agents that I'll mention briefly. I don't have time to talk about their mechanism of action, but what I want you to remember from this is there are three mainstays of immunosuppression that are relatively cheap. Azathioprine, mycophenolate, mofidil, and even rituximab has come down in price, but azathioprine doesn't work really well for NMO. Mycophenolate, mofidil, Celsept works essentially as well as rituximab, but avoid azathioprine is my advice to you. There are four new drugs that are out there that can be used to treat these patients with NMO spectrum disorder. They target complement or CD19 or the IL-6 receptor. They are all monoclonal antibodies. They're all given by infusion. They are all crazy expensive, but they are also very effective and at least three of them have been approved by the FDA now for use in the United States. I'm not switching my patients who are stable on one of those other drugs to one of these new drugs, but if a patient comes in with a new diagnosis of NMO, I'm likely to give them one of these things. I'll finish up by talking about MOG because MOG is different than NMO. So although those patients who have MOG positive optic neuritis have a pretty significant incidence of recurrent optic neuritis, not a lot of them, and these are data from a study out of the Mayo Clinic, not a lot of them actually develop severe permanent vision loss, unlike patients with NMO spectrum disorder. So the treatment of these patients, you have a few more options. You have a little more time to talk. Absolutely, you want to treat them with IV steroids. You want to treat them with a long oral steroid taper, but I don't always put them in fact, if it's their first attack, I don't put them on long-term immunosuppression. I taper them down off the steroid and I wait to see what happens. So that's MOG-associated disease, long steroid taper and wait. NMO, and they have the aquaporin-4 antibody, I'm going to start them on aggressive immunosuppression because they're at high risk for something bad happening again. If they're seronegative, maybe you have a little wiggle room, but I'm still pretty likely to start them on immunosuppression. Anyone with rapid steroid response gets a long steroid treatment, and you still you need to find the underlying cause. That MOG and NMO are both negative. Make sure you haven't forgotten infection, perineoplastic, those other steroid-dependent things. So we've studied typical optic neuritis a lot. The main risk is progression to MS, and prophylactic treatment with MS drugs may be indicated. That's for you to work with the neurologist to do. Everything else is atypical optic neuritis. It takes a lot of forms. You need to work up for the underlying cause. The visual outcome is variable. All these patients in 2020 should get corticosteroid treatment and long-term treatment may prevent future vision loss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prem. That was a wonderful talk and you gave a brilliant overview of the optic neuritis evaluation and management. And I think it's open for uh, a discussion. Any questions from the panel? Okay, uh, let me begin with a question. 
do you decide your investigations based on the recovery pattern of the neuritis? I mean, in other words, like what is the sequence of the recovery? The vision better, color vision better, the fields last? Are there any sure. instances where you have seen persistent field defects which made you decide to revise your investigations? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. So when the patient first walks in the door, if they look like a typical op, you, know, you make that decision, right? Does it look typical or atypical? So what do I do? Let's say I thought they were typical, but they aren't getting better then absolutely, I'm going to investigate them for atypical causes. So that patient maybe who had 624 vision, if she came back four weeks later and now was 660, that would be a red flag for me. If the visual field, many patients with optic neuritis have persistent visual field defects, but if there's absolutely no improvement, absolutely, that's a reason to think about doing further investigations. And of course, if they have some atypical findings on overall examination or they develop fellow eye involvement, those are reasons to do that. But yes, failure of vision to recover, failure of visual field to improve, or subsequent development of optic nerve swelling. I always see the patients back within two weeks to make sure I have not missed swelling of their nerve or a conversion to, say, a neuroretinitis. Prim, uh, what's your uh, threshold for lumbar puncture? When do you get the lumbar puncture done in patients with optic neuritis? If the patient, I, if I think they have typical optic neuritis, I'm going to leave the decision about lumbar puncture to the neurologist when I refer the patient to them to evaluate that MS risk. But I would say that in most patients with atypical optic neuritis, I'm going to get a lumbar puncture. And that's because I want, if they have intrathecal inflammation, if their CSF shows cells or shows elevated protein, then that right away will drive me in a different direction than a NMO sort of picture, for example. Is there any uh, significance of the titers of all? <clears throat> so could it be possible that, uh, you know, a weak titer positive may not actually be MOG? I think that's true, Rohit, and I think we're learning more about that. Right? MOG, we've really only studied well in the past, not even decade. So I think you're right. When the MOG is very positive, and for me, that's more than 1 to 100, mm -hmm. lower, so 1 to 100 or greater, then I'm pretty confident that the MOG is real. But I have definitely had some MOGs come back 1 to 10, and I don't know exactly what to do with that unless likely to say to the patient, oh, this is definitely what you have. So can there be any other diseases where we can have mock positivity, like what you say, like any other conditions? Ab absolutely. I think we need to be very careful, especially in pediatric patients. At least a quarter of patients with optic neuritis in, pedi in some pediatric studies have had MOG positivity, and that's perhaps more associated with a, an ADEM condition rather than a true MOG-associated disease, and it follows a different course, it has a different prognosis, it doesn't have the same risk for relapse. And that's, to me, the importance of MOG positivity is that it is a signal, a sign that the patient is at increased risk for relapses down the road. Remember, MOG, the antibody itself, is not what causes the disease. It's a marker that's different from NMO, right? In NMO, that alcohol 4 antibody is the disease-causing antibody. That's not true for MOG. So that's a little bit of a difference there. Uh, how frequently you have seen uh, patients with neuritis with non-classical MS brain lesions, but sometimes neurologists do advise for few of this newer oral MS drugs like dimethylfumarate and all those are being advised for patients who just came with a neuritis, probably recovered, but just because they had some brain lesions and they were markers negative. I mean, I see off late few patients are being advised for these. So hmm. what do you I'd suggest? Be a little cons I'd be concerned about that. You know, we don't know that the oral agents might not do the same thing that the interferon betas did. And so I, I'm, I would be hesitant to exactly. recommend those agents to patients who don't fit the diagnostic criteria for MS or clinically isolated syndrome, high risk for MS.
Um, and you know, and, and there, there's a question in the chat yeah, that came yeah, from the attendees about a similar question of, so that you have an older patient who presents yeah. with uh, unilateral symptoms, but bilateral enhancement of the optic nerve. And do we take it as bilateral optic neuritis? I think you have to. I think that is telling you that this, you know, that fits with the atypical nature of the fact that it's a 70 year old man to begin with that he has something unusual there you need to investigate is this perineoplastic is this tb is this nmo um, i the oldest patient in whom i've made a new diagnosis of nmo um, was uh, 65 years old uh, but she was thought to have gca because she lost vision to no light perception in one eye and understandably because of her age that was the diagnosis that was given but ultimately she developed nmo Okay, one quick question. Do you ever agree an MRI brain and orbit plane without contrast? <laughs> That's one thing which we frequently bump into. And the radiologists yeah. say there's no signal. Why do I give why do I give contrast? Right. So two things there. If you get um, good T2 or STIR images of the orbit, it can show you edema or other changes, hyperintensity within the optic nerve that can help you. So let's say you have a patient with very bad renal function and just can't get contrast. So that can help you. But I, I agree with you that if not getting contrast will lead to missing some of these cases without a doubt. And so unless there's a real contraindication, I push hard to get the contrast to be administered. And I explain whether in this country, I have to explain sometimes to the insurance company why they should pay for uh, contrast. You may have to explain to the patient why you want them to pay for contrast and to the radiologist as to why you want them to do it. Thank you. And Prim, uh, when you have a diagnosis of uh, NMO spectrum disorder, do you at the same time also uh, investigate for other autoimmune disorders which can be associated with NOSD or uh, you do it as a second step? I, I do that as a second step. I don't necessarily want a full panel investigation once, uh, you know, at the same time as the NMO. I'm going to be a little more targeted uh, just based on what I see on the MRI. So I have a question which goes on with that. But so, so if supposing you know, a patient has come back to you with a second episode uh, or a recurrence possibly, and the patient has previously had a whole load of investigations already done, including let's say, the NMO titers or the anti-mob, would you reorder them in your set of investigations again? Or do you suppose if, they're, if they've been negative once, they're negative, at least particularly for NMO, let's say? NMO in particular, it's been shown that there's a subset of patients who will be negative the first time you test them. And if you test six months later, even if they haven't had another episode, if you test them six months later, now you'll find positive antibody. So uh, we routinely retest patients where we have a strong clinical suspicion for NMO spectrum disorder, but the antibody was negative on initial evaluation. We routinely retest them six months later. So I would right. encourage you, if, especially if the patient comes back with a new episode, definitely get the type, get the investigation. So again, it's not a waste of time money. Thank so, you. Thank you. I think we'll go on to the next talk. Uh, Mahesh. So we'll have Dr. Mahesh who will be talking on infectious optic neuritis. So another one thing we come across not infrequently and Mahesh, uh, a master in them uh, on infectious optic neuritis, Mahesh. Uh, good evening. First, I would like to thank Dr. Rohit and uh, the executive committee members of the Indian Neuroophthalmic Society for having uh, inviting me to speak on this topic. Infectious optic neuropathy, unlike the two previous topics, is not as common as the demyelinative or the autoimmune optic neuropathies. But we need to know about infectious opt optic neuropathies so, so that we do not miss any uh, potential treatable uh, infections. Even in the pre-antibiotic era, the infectious optic uh, nerve uh, uh, disorders were quite uncommon. And most of, more often than not, we encounter a sterile demination or, auto, or autoimmune optic neuropathies. But with the advent of uh, AIDS and other immunocompromising conditions, uh, it has become a little bit more common nowadays. Uh, but overall, it is uh, relatively rare compared to the uh, non-infectious entities. Uh, some of the post-viral optic neuritis which we encounter, especially in children, are more often para-infectious uh, following conditions like encephalomyelitis, uh, 
the clinical features of these infectious optic neuritis may not be very different uh, from the routine optic neuritis like a subnormal visual acuity, a dyschromatopsia and relative afferent pupillary defect or a visual field defect. Uh, the presentation can be quite variable also. It can be acute or a subacute onset, unilateral or bilateral and periocular discomfort. However, unfortunately, none of these are really useful in differentiating infectious versus non-infectious optic neuropathies. The pathogenesis of these optic neuropathies can be a localized uh, invasion or it could be a contiguous uh, spread. In localized invasion, it could be a direct invasion or it could be a contiguous spread through the, from the adjacent adnexa or the paranasal sinuses, which we see not uncommonly as a sinusitis patients, especially fungal sinusitis patients uh, having optic neuropathies, bilateral uh, vision loss due to bilateral optic neuropathies uh, due to an associated fungal sinusitis. Uh, sometimes it could be a hematogenous spread by a variety of organisms like uh, uh, viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites or spirochetal organisms. So in order to describe this entity, we can uh, broadly divide it into two uh, categories, two clinical settings. Uh, one could be an immunocompromised uh, patient and one is a immunocompetent patient because it is slightly different in these uh, two set of patients. Uh, in the immunohiv neuropathies, uh, the infections could be due to a direct infection by the HIV virus or it could be due to an immune reaction by the HIV infected macrophages or it could be an opportunistic infection by the associated infective agents in the HIV infected patient. The manifestations in the HIV optic neuropathy could be optic perineuritis, papillitis, erythrobulbar optic neuritis, or it could simply be a papilledema due to uh, involvement of the central nervous system causing optic neuropathies. The primary HIV optic neuropathy again could be erythrobulbar or it could be an ischemic optic neuropathy and the vision loss could be acute uh, or progress, acute and progressive. It could be mild or severe with a periocular discomfort on eye movements. The HIV uh, virus is a neurotropic virus and it has a predilection for involvement in the central nervous system and the ocular effects could be direct effect on the retinal ganglion cells or the axons. So one of the opportunistic infections in the HIV patient is uh, could be a viral infection and uh, uh, one of the common infection is a CMA infection leading to uh, blindness in the AIDS patient. It could be an isolated optic nerve infection which may be a little uncommon or more commonly it could be a secondary optic neuropathy from a juxtapapillary cytomegalovirus infection retinitis uh, which is more common with a vision loss with a disc edema and the associated CME infection uh, uh, features. The other viral infections could be a uh, hepatic infections either a zoster or a simplex more commonly a zoster uh, which could be unilateral and severe. The optic nerve could be swollen, normal with associated with the macular star. The optic neuritis is a severe granulomatous inflammation and or it could be an arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy or it could be a retrobulbar ischemic optic neuropathy. And this is one of the uh, examples of a uh, zoster optic neuritis with the uh, coexistent retinal lesions here. Among the fungal lesions of immunocompromised patients, Cryptococcus and Aspergillus uh, are uh, commonly found. And out of this, Cryptococcus is the more common uh, organism causing CNS infections and optic neuropathies. Uh, it has a predilection for involvement of the anterior visual pathways in the AIDS patients. Uh, this is an example of a Cryptococcus optic nerve infection uh, with the coexistent CNS infections. Uh, with the advent, in the advent of a specific antibiotics, secondary syphilis we see uh, not uh, very rarely nowadays, but secondary syphilis can cause optic perineuritis, papillitis or a retrobulb neuritis. And in the appropriate setting, we need to test for uh, syphilis also uh, in order not to miss an infectious cause. In the immunocompetent host, again the organisms could be all these organisms, viral, bacterial, fungal, protozoal or spirochetes. Among them, uh, bacterial is more common in the everyday uh, clinical practice, especially uh, with the tuberculous uh, bacterial meningitis causing optic neuropathy, which is more common sometimes causing devastating visual loss. Paranasal sinusitis again with, uh, due to bacterial infection again can cause a direct spread of the inflammation 
and, uh, and in many conditions, uh, simple treatment of the uh, paranasal yeah. infections alone uh, uh, with a uh, ENT surgeon by an ENT surgeon, either surgery or with the appropriate antibiotics is enough to cure these optic neuritis. So uh, this is the reason why we need to, apart from many other reasons, this is one of the reasons why we need to properly neurimage these patients in order not to miss out an infectious cause like a bacterial infection or fungal infection before giving an IV steroids. So uh, we need to uh, neuroimage and clearly rule out any infectious cause. Of course, tuberculosis, which is the more common. Uh, this is uh, tuberculosis uh, optic neuritis. Uh, more, more commonly, it doesn't uh, present to the neuroophthalmologist in an isolated manner. It commonly presents along with an uveitic conditions. It, it can cause all these called granulomas. It can cause uveitis causes. And coexistently, it can cause these optic nerve lesions. It can be neuroretinitis, an optic neuropathy. It can be a contiguous spread from the chorad. Or it could be a hematogenous spread or a direct infection or sometimes due to hypersensitivity to the tuberculous antigens. Uh, we might see an optic nerve tubercle here. We can have a tubercle or some choroidal tubercles in association with optic neuritis. So carefully in these patients of optic neuritis with a disc edema, do a dilated examination, look for any other choroidal tubercles or any other associated inflammations or any other uh, vitreous cells before deciding on a case of a isolated optic neuritis, especially in the Indian setting, make sure we are not missing out all these coexistent lesions. It could be papillitis, it could be a papilledema, it could be a retrobulbar neuritis, uh, it could be neuroretinitis, or it could be an optico-chiasmatic arachnoiditis. These are the uh, varieties of uh, ways by which a tuberculosis infection can cause optic nerve uh, involvement. So this is a case of a 14-year-old boy with a, who presented to us with defective vision, both eyes of one month duration. He had a history of fever with headache and vomiting of four, of four months duration, uh, prior to four months, three months prior to the onset of defective vision. And he had a family history of uh, tuberculosis. Father had been treated for tuberculosis three years back with an anti-tuberculosis treatment. And for the present infection, he was treated with antibiotics, taking off an, uh, uh, to a bacterial meningitis. He was also given anti-tuberculosis uh, treatment along with mannitol for a meningitis. On presentation, the patient presented us with a hand movement vision in the right eye and in the left eye it was 2 by 60. Pupils bilaterally was uh, uh, 5 millimeter dilated and sluggishly reacting to light. There is no clear IPD because both were both pupils were uh, almost symmetrically affected uh, so that uh, IPD could not be discernible but the pupils were sluggishly reacting to light. So at presentation to us, this was the uh, uh, patient's uh, fundus. He already had a bilateral optic uh, neuropathy. He had a bilateral uh, temporal pallor with the papillomacular bundle loss. And um, it, we can think of a variety of things in this condition. We can think of a ethambutal uh, associated optic neuropathy, or we can think of a direct tuberculosis uh, infection. But here we have a bilateral optic nerve problem. So in this case, we need to think of a uh, more uh, central nervous system problem because of a bilateral uh, uh, problem or an ethambutal optic neuropathy. So this was a pay, uh, pay, uh, CT scan the patient had and uh, it was apparently normal. It was a non-contrast study. And you can see here a contrast study <coughs> of the CT scan uh, taken then showed a clear enhancing lesions in the chiasmatic lesion. The coronal uh, sections show clearly. Uh, this is a chiasm and you can see this grape-like enhancement of the tubercular ring-like lesions in the chiasm causing optico-chiasmatic arachnoiditis causing bilateral optic neuropathies and vision loss. So this optico-chiasmatic arachnoiditis causes vision loss by causing an arteritis uh, which is inflammation of the arteries supplying the chiasm and it is uh, this reason we need to treat these patients uh, with steroids also along with anti-tuberculous treatment to kill the inflammation and to save the blood vessels and uh, save the optic chiasm. So uh, this patient in consultation with the neurologist uh, was uh, continued with antibiotic treatment and uh, he was taken off the ethambutal to, uh, uh, to possibly not miss an ethambutal optic neuropathy along with other antitubercular treatment and along with steroids and gradually, slowly and very gradually this patient vision, vision improved to 6 by 9 over a period of 1 year. So the take home point in this uh, case is uh, 
to have clear contrast enhanced uh, preferably an mri sequence of the opt brain also in addition to the optic nerves and look in the chiasmatic region and also consider steroids discuss with the neurologist and if there is a vision loss consider steroids also under anti tuberculosis uh, cover to treat these patients there can be other manifestations of these infectious optic neuropathies so there it can be associated with the neuroretinitis you can see the 360 degree macular star along with the macular edema along with the optic uh, optic nerve swelling so in the indian setting even though in the western cellist uh, setting uh, catch catch disease is commonly described in the indian setting tuberculosis should be ruled out in all these neuroretinitis the here the organism spread from the choroid to the juxta papillary retina other manifestations uh, could be a posterior tuberculous scleritis or an anterior scleria scleritis in addition to this posterior segment lesions leber stellate neuroretinitis presents typically with a macular star as discussed cat scratch is common in western countries occasionally very occasionally we see them in our country leptospirosis is a common uh, was once a is a common condition in our country which can potentially cause this neuroretinitis and uh, in general it is associated with intraocular inflammation and generalized lymphadenopathy and appropriate antibiotics with steroid cover cover has to be given and sometimes pyrocytal infections like uh, lyme disease uh, can also cause a, a neuroretinitis optic neuritis and it can be associated with anterior vitis or vitritis uh, and appropriate antibiotics like uh, doxycycline may have to be given so in all these conditions whenever it is associated with uh, uh uv it is we need to go the uh, uv it is specialist also in the management of this uh, co management of these conditions so in summary optic now uh, opt infective optic neuropathies is a slightly uncommon entity but it should not be missed out we need to have a high index of suspicion by means of uh, looking for vitreous cells or any other posterior segment infectious uh, conditions like a choroidal tubercle or a retinal retinitis patches prompt recognition and treatment is the key in this condition thank you thank you so much mesh i think it was uh, very nicely done uh, any questions from the panel so my take uh, on uh, infectious optic neuritis is this that uh, we should as was mentioned by ambika prem and rohit is that uh, we should always have infectious optic neuritis in the mix because that's one of our common causes of optic neuritis is number 1 number 2 you have to remember that a lot of these cases would have some amount of associated meningeal involvement so look out for it in uh, mri and to have a very low threshold for uh, doing lumbar puncture because that's how in most instances you will be able to confirm uh, the the infection presence of infection in fact what mahesh mentioned we had a case where uh, it there was a rapid decline in vision from 69 to no pl in 3 days with a massive disc edema and uh, mri showing perineuritis with little orbital inflammation as well and uh, as patient was put on steroids patient underwent a lumbar puncture and we found a uh, cryptococcus and there was one of the rare instances where uh, there was a cryptococcal optic neuritis in a immunocompetent patient immunocompetent patients can have cryptococcal meningitis that's described but optic neuritis in an immunocompetent patients uh, with cryptococcus is very rare so uh, in other words uh, i think if you if if you feel that there are atypical features as prem also mentioned uh, early lumbar puncture uh, should be uh, in the mix of investigations uh, that was a uh, that was a very nice presentation dr mahesh i have one question your patient mm -hmm. had a probable tb meningitis that young boy some 4 months back with vomiting headache and a vision loss but subsequently after uh, i think there was a gap of 3 months when he presented to you with a drop in vision so the lumbar puncture was performed at the time of tb meningitis or at the time of the vision loss number 1 number 2 is how frequently you have seen patients having a tb meningitis having a good recovery in vision yeah thank you dr ambika <coughs> Uh, for the first question the lumbar puncture that patient was uh, uh, done about 4 months back it was uh, uh, prior to the presentation and it was a neurological diagnosis and uh, subsequently uh, we did a, a 
yeah we did not do a lumbar puncture when he presented to us so it was a prior diagnosis uh, uh, answering your number question number 2 uh, this is one of the rarer situations where we had a near uh, complete recovery of the central vision <coughs> but in many instances uh, about 50% of the cases uh, the visual recovery is not good and about one or two percent of the patients uh, no, it, when it has been no light perception at presentation it has remained at no light perception forever which is very unfortunately but many of these patients we have seen that the vision has at least improved to about some navigable vision like around 60 or so and uh, I, i would say that uh, aggressively following these patients uh, we can at least recover some amount of reasonable amount of useful vision for these patients uh, but very rarely we have as i mentioned one or two patients have remained in like such uh can i ask the other panel also their experience regarding the same so dr i'll just I'll, i'll just uh, before i come to your answer i just wanted to uh, inform that we at our peak had 1660 viewers which is an amazing number and just tells us how amazing speakers both prem and andrew and of course mahesh are so a big draw for a neuro ophthalmology meeting having 1660 people listening is 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 great so that one i'll just add to what rashmi also talked about that when you are i mean any patient of disc edema please dilate and examine the eyes do an indirect in all patients and we've all burnt our fingers by seeing you know an undilated pupil uh, seeing the disc on 90d seeing the edema and not actually dilating and seeing what mahesh has beautifully shown us choroidal involvements in infectious uh, uh, causes of disc edema so uh, in our setting we frequently burn our fingers by this and later on it turns out that there was something else including choroiditis including vasculitis so uh, we've had patients diagnosed as optic neuritis because of the edema and sudden loss of vision and rapd and they give steroids and they get kind of get better and they come back the moment you stop steroids because it was posterior scleritis or vasculitis for a right to start so always it's a take home message uh, your examination should be complete you should not miss any other ocular you know finding uh, which could immediately help you on your diagnosis uh, coming to tubercular our experience i would say of course what mahesh has talked about the tb involves or results in visual loss in so many multiple ways including you know direct toxic involvement because of the basal meninges getting involved tuberculomas in the visual pathway so you could have uh, you know tuberculomas like sitting on the chiasma or on the occipital lobes Uh, you could have of course something to always worry about is toxic optic neuropathy because of ethambutol and of course the other drugs now which are increasingly being reported so uh, because of its wide spectrum of uh, you know damage to the visual pathway it's important that each one of them be managed differently and each one of may have different outcomes so you know uh, depending upon the damage that has occurred or if it's just because of the toxic damage you may expect some visual recovery but if it's direct involvement Uh, of the optic nerve or the pathway you may have you know limited outcomes and toxic is something you must always be careful about and if the patient has specially optic nerve involvement because of tubercular process you must advise that the uh, ethambutol should be avoided because you are dealing with a compromised optic nerve which may not be able to you know be able to accept the toxicity even if mild uh, which may have just passed off uh because of ethambutol so that would that's what i would say when ethambutol or uh, tuberculosis is associated so what are your investigations <laughs> to confirm it's tb <laughs> that's a very very i mean common question which all, we all puzzle with so what are your algorithm which says yes this is tb <clears throat> to open to all the panel mahesh has to go first <laughs> mahesh mahesh is the first taker <laughs> yeah so of course uh, there is no single answer to this <laughs> and uh, uh, we do all i mean if we uh, as uh, as discussed already in uh, some other meetings we do the ppd manto and uh, uh, chest x rays and uh, sometimes uh, uh, we don't do quantiferon gold uh, So PCR, PCR is sometimes uh, that is confirmatory, sort of con- confirmatory. Uh, 
and may, in many instances uh, it is it will be a presumptive uh, anti tuberculosis treatment yeah so i think the problem is complicated in india because as was mentioned i think in some of the discussions that because we all had had bcg so uh, you can't rely on a lot of these uh, tests that you would have otherwise relied on number one number two there is a possibility that you might find new or old tuberculosis in some patients and that helps you but if you don't have any features clinical features that there is already a tuberculosis which has caused other clinical feature in the body then i think it's extremely difficult to pinpoint that this optic neuritis is related as ruth mentioned and amika mentioned directly because of infection or because of immune reaction to mycobacterium tuberculosis and a lot of times you might just have to go with a therapy trial if the index of suspicion is very high because as i think there was a paper by uh, uh, dr ratnam as well and dr amod gupta which mentioned that how difficult it is to confirm yeah. tuberculosis in any other even not only optic neuritis but even uveitis uvi uh, how difficult it is correlated unless you have a full proof uh, fluid which shows a uh, pcr positivity so uh, sometimes we do end up in few infectious serology which turn out to be positive where we are not expecting that to turn to be positive because like uh, one of our patients who was classical demyelinating neuritis she had an investigation which was carrying a lyme serology which is escalating pattern and she did not have any serological i mean systemic manifestation of it come on now i am having a lyme serology and i would put her on a high dose of immunosuppression so uh, dr brain like uh, you have seen lot of limes So have you come across such situation? No, um, Lyme is very regional in this country, and so it tends to be very much the northeast U.S. And so when I was in Baltimore, yes, so a lot of the patients with Lyme, and the, the treatment of it's incredibly controversial. Um, there's this concept of chronic Lyme and neural Lyme, which uh, may or may not exist. And so, yeah, the, I, I think that puts us in a difficult situation. And I. I I can't say that I have encountered fortunately too many patients who have been put in this situation but it, uh, it it does arise every now and again and I think the important thing to keep in mind is that there's no evidence that long term treatment of patients with with a Lyme infection is really necessary. Okay, thank you. So great I think uh uh again it's just updated we have 2346 viewers so we are you know getting better maturing with time you know like wine so one question prem uh, we had discussed that you know we are picking up uh, optic neuritis in a much older set of patients so one question that has come uh, on the youtube was that how would you differentiate optic neuritis in older individual with tiun so when you don't have any findings how would you consider uh, the difference Sure. So PION is always a diagnosis of exclusion and PION characteristically is painless, not painful. Uh it was mentioned that sometimes you can see if you get a a diffusion weighted imaging that you might get lucky a DTI and you might see some restricted diffusion in the optic nerve but ultimately i think it's it's going to have to be heavily weighted on a clinical diagnosis. So is the patient having severe vision loss is the patient does the patient have vascular risk factors does the patient's brain mri show anything else and i think the right approach to someone like this is what uh, andy and i had both mentioned which is if you can't fall securely on one side or the other well think about what the consequences are if someone has pion then you may want to look for cardiac abnormalities or carotid disease that could put them at risk for cerebral ischemia. But if someone has optic neuritis with severe vision loss, you might help them get better by investigating an underlying inflammatory cause and treating them with corticosteroids. So it's a conversation that I have with the patient. It's not that I sit down in front of the patient and say, this is exactly what you have and this is what we are going to do. I say you might have PION, you might have optic neuritis. This is why I'm not sure or why I can't be sure right now and this is what we're going to do to try to separate these two things. Can I ask you a question Dr. Yeah, Roy? Yeah. yeah uh, how frequently you get a carotid artery evaluation in a setting of ischemic optic neuropathy? If so, what is your mode of investigation? 
I don't routinely get it in NAION because it really has not been shown to be an embolic disease. So I don't routinely obtain it. I do speak to the patient and have them, of course, see their primary care physician to discuss cardiovascular risk factors. And if there's some other reason to think that they should get carotid artery imaging, then in this country, we still tend to start with carotid duplex study before going on to a CTA or MRA to investigate right. further. But I leave that to the primary physician, and I don't think that's something that has a high yield in patients with NAION. You know, Andy mentioned earlier the hypercoagulable workup, these sorts of things. None of those have really been shown to have high benefit. Sure, some of these patients have elevated homocysteine and things, but I consider that more of a workup for systemic cardiovascular risk factors than it is something that is highly associated with their optic nerve disease. Uh, maybe would you consider that because that's one question from our glaucoma colleagues, particularly when they are treating the normal tension glaucomas, they keep their intraocular pressure, they do maintain with the glaucoma medications way down, but in spite of that, they would worsen in the fields. So that's the point where they ask us, what would you do in addition? Like, of course, we would have imaged and ruled out other causes, but mm -hmm. would you consider a Doppler analysis at that time? Or would you ask for an MRA neck? I think that either one would be reasonable, and maybe an MRA neck would be better in that situation because it is a little more sensitive. And the point you're raising is that that patient could be having some ongoing uh, flow issues, some decreased perfusion, and that the carotid study might be useful in that situation. And yes, I agree that that could be helpful there where you want to make sure you're not missing some other cause for the continued drop in vision. Thank you. Prem, how are uh, imaging, uh, flow imaging for ophthalmic artery or uh, choroidal vessels or short posterior ciliary arteries? I, I mean, are we anyway better off now or being able to, you know, get some idea of flow there? I, I missed the beginning of your question. I'm sorry. This is uh, I'm just further. talking about uh, uh, Dopplers of the ophthalmic artery and the short posterior ciliary arteries and any way we get it from there. I, I think at least in my institution and the institution of North America, that still is a very specialized study. And it, I don't have ready access to someone who can do this. Sure, I think from a research standpoint, it's something we should do to learn more about flow in those vessels and to see if it helps us to understand who's at risk for ischemic conditions. But it's, it's not something I have access to routinely on a clinical basis and not something I use in my clinical practice. So is it an orbital Doppler, Dr. Rohit? Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm, why I'm asking is that earlier some, you know, there was some work going on in uh, orbital color Dopplers and, mm -hmm. you know, trying to image the ophthalmic artery and there was some studies mm -hmm. that were trying to associate NAION with short posterior sure. trajectory, but the imaging is not good. You don't know you read, what are you looking at? You see some red dots showing arterial flow, you know, very confident for it. You can never go back to them, so you don't know where you're imaging the same thing again, so. That's why I just right. thought that is there anything, you know, in the pipeline to help us with. Yeah, not but that I I'm aware of it. There's, there's still work, I think, in the glaucoma arena. There's some people also yes. looking at this. Looking yes. So, great. I, I think uh, we are done with this edition of the INOS International Webinar. I thank NTOD for helping us put this together. And with the numbers, I'm sure the advertising was great. And people are very interested in neuro-ophthalmology in India and all over the world. And I can say that we look forward to another such series, another such episode of this series. And as always, it's always a pleasure to have Prem and Andy talk with their absolutely clear ideas and their super presentations. And Mahesh, who added that, you know, much needed Indian perspective uh, about the infectious optic neuritis that we see. Again, uh, thank you, Prem. Thank you, Andy and Mahesh. And uh, of course, my panelists with me, a wonderful comments and discussion, Ambika, Rashmin, uh, Ankur, Digvijay, and Satya, uh, and uh, of course, many who've been following us through YouTube and Facebook. So everybody, thank you very much. Any last words, Rashmin, before we close? Uh, unmute, Rashmin. Unmute, Rashmin, unmute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Prem. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Ambika, Mahesh, Rohit.
It was a great, uh, and we look forward to the next uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank, thank you, you, everybody, and bye bye. Have a great day, Afrem. Thank you, everyone. Shant, you have put your photo on. Good to see you. Thank you, Raman ji. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We are off now. We are not live anymore. Yeah, just not check it, sir. Once. Yeah, great, great, great. Okay, okay. Bye, Nishant. Bye, Raman. And if you're listening, thank you.